Woot. All right, we're live. <laughs> Welcome to Dive Into World Building, where we are all still here. <laughs> and today we're going to talk about isolation because what else would we talk about? <laughs> um seriously though no um <clears throat> it's weird it's weird running this show in lockdown times because in some ways there's nothing different about it but on some level it feels completely different from the way that it did before lockdown times and i'm not sure why it does i mean even though we've never I think I've, I've never been to a live event in person with you. It's like still it feels different that we're in this month 24 of lockdown or whatever it is at this point. <laughs> yeah. It feels, I it suspect feels it has to do with, with having more in-person um, interactions or having had more in-person interactions before. Because for me, it doesn't feel a whole lot different, but then I didn't have a whole lot of in-person interactions with you know, it could anybody. Be the, it could be the balance of the in-person interactions versus this kind of interaction. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I mean, I have friends in the <laughs> city I have not seen in person in months. I mean, I've seen a few of them on Zoom calls and that's it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's very, it, it is, distancing in a very uncomfortable way yeah it's my, that most of my more normal right yeah. this is just like yet another zoom meeting <laughs> before it was my one and only zoom meeting that i did uh, and i mean on the one hand it was great because i knew how to use zoom before this whole lockdown thing started <laughs> like, like i'm ahead of the curve a dive into world building advantage <laughs> <laughs> we are the future, right? Yeah, it, it's true. I mean, before 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 the lockdown, I'd never used Zoom except for this, and now I use Zoom and Microsoft Teams all the time. It's yeah. So this is just another Zoom meeting, except with people, except it's not work related, thankfully. Yeah. Well, so here we are. <laughs> so, so there's there's a, a difference between um, most of the people that I'm close to, my family, are scattered. You know, my sister is in, in halfway across the country. My parents are in another state. Mm -hmm. um, my kids are the only ones that I see. You know, my husband, I live with him, but, <laughs> but my mm -hmm. kids are the only ones that I are close enough geographically that I can actually go and see them. And so that's been hard because mostly we don't we go we drop stuff off and we go away we don't spend more than a few minutes with them um mm -hmm. day before father's day we did we visited for an hour two hours i don't know we were there for a while um <laughs> and that was um that was really nice but most of the people that i'm close to i'm already distance you know it's facebook and messenger and um phone sometimes but so i'm not except for my kids i'm not a whole lot more distant from people i'm close to than i was i'm That's using the same so technology who do you guys have them. um who do you other guys have that you interact with in a person-to-person -person sense m most often well there's a monthly meetup of writers here in the twin cities that marissa lingam sets up. So I see a bunch of people every month. I occasionally have lunches with Catherine Lundoff and William Morris, who are two more writers here in the Twin Cities. So basically you have a lot of writer connections, which is cool. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, I see Juliet once a month. And you're not <laughs> yeah, writer. or so. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, um, and I was taking my kids to school and picking them up from school and seeing my parents who are local uh, several times a week and spending time inside their house as opposed to on their porch socially distanced uh, or in their big backyard area, co uh, collective backyard in their complex um, socially distanced. 
Um, and then there are, I used to go to a lot of concerts, I used to go to live music, I used to go to a lot of readings where I would see like SF and SF uh, reading or Writers with Drinks reading, which is in a crowded bar in San Francisco. Um, so, you know. Um, yeah, cause like, I mean, I have some local friends that I see and then I have writers that I see and then I have, I suppose taking my kids to school. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, there's grocery shopping and appointments, but I feel like, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you still have to get food, right? <laughs> yeah. But the thing I think that I miss the most is just hanging out with, with a friend occasionally for fun. On yeah. the other hand, I'm, I'm less isolated in some ways than I was because my family is constantly here with me. So it's, it's really more like a, like a rebalancing of, of the things in my day than it is a, well, going from being with people to not being with people. Mm -hmm. So it's different people. Yeah. It's just different people. I have a, a, a needlework group that, um, that still meets and the plus side is that more people can, can come. I mean, mm. You don't have to travel physically. Um, if you happen to be out of town, you can come anyway. Um, so that's that's the plus side. The downside is, um, you know, that we, we can't be there in person. And so we don't get tea and snacks unless we provide our own. <laughs> and <laughs> that was... Own tea and snacks. <laughs> well, but, okay, we have a bunch of Jewish women getting together to gossip and do needlework. So you think there's not going to be food? <laughs> So, um, but we still get together and we still gossip and some of us even do needlework. Um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, so, okay. So, so. Uh, the hardest thing for me has been Aikido. Oh, uh, interesting. Um, that is a martial art. I like, I have been actually practicing Tai Chi and even Karate from my younger days to help work out. And I miss going to the gym. I work out at home, but Aikido um, is Aikido is uh, um, two people tossing each other, right? Yeah. Um, you cannot social distance for most of it. We can do like weapons training. We can do some solo practices and we've been having regular Zoom classes. Now the one advantage is there's a, a student on the regular Zoom classes from Montana who I, you know, has never trained in our dojo. And she's like three times a week, four times a week. Cool. She's training with us, training with us <laughs> in, in cyberspace. Um, on the, and so the sensei has been having these classes. He's been doing exercises, meditations, history of Aikido lessons. Uh, he also teaches Tai Chi. So he's been doing Tai Chi. He's been doing weapons training, but you know, um, the whole tossing someone around a mat thing that is 99% of Aikido. Yeah. Unless you happen to be sheltered in place with another Aikidoka, which I am not, <laughs> you know, that is a problem. Yes. Yeah, so um, the way that we process a Zoom meeting is not the same way that we process a face-to-face -face interaction. I did a I did a study one time when I, back when I was studying um, linguistics uh, and it was about kids learning how to talk on the phone because, um, you know, once you've learned how to talk on the phone, you're liable to think that it's a lot like talking to other people. But in fact, it has very different rules and you have very different sensory inputs and so it really doesn't come out feeling the same way that being with somebody and talking with them does and i think the zoom meetings are the same it's just a slightly different equation i like the idea now i'm thinking uh, now getting to writing and into media now thinking of how star trek got it wrong and like start what star trek needed was people actually having zoom meetings to really understand how people actually interact in this meeting versus just having people talk face to face through a through a screen on the on the enterprise 
now we understand how people actually interact in this space a lot better because we're all doing it every day now. It's true. It's true. So there's a um, <clears throat> story uh, from early 20th century that I mentioned in a previous, in the context of a previous uh, dive, which is um, the machine stops in which everyone is isolated in a room and existing only in a society of Zoom meetings, essentially, um, but written like over a hundred years ago. And um, that's a good, the core of the world building is that, right? The whole story is about that bit of world building. Um, can I transition into some world building, some fictional stuff? Yeah. Okay, so one of my favorite uh, stories of isolation is Kelly Eskridge, Solitaire, mm -hmm. which uh, mm -hmm. this is the, um, uh, I think it's Small Beer. Yeah, Small Beer Edition. It's reprint edition. It's a wonderful story. It's a uh, future science fiction, like mid 21st century, I think. And um, at one point, the protagonist um, gets put in, is sentenced to um, be in a, a prison situation, but in a prison situation where she's put in solitary confinement in a virtual reality in her mind. Um, and the idea is that this is more humane because she can serve out like however many decades of prison in about three years of real time and then return to her life after having been awake and alert in a prison cell in VR for like decades, right? <laughs> now, what that, and it's, mm. that's why it's called solitaire, right? <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's very, and, and she goes into the sensory hallucinations that go in with solitary confinement and the mental issues, the emotional mental state issues that come with, I mean, it was a deep dive into the psychology of solitary confinement for about half the book, you know? So um, that is, that's sort of one way of fictionalizing like, and then, you, then the question as a writer, I was not so much the world building as the how do you tell a story with only one character in a scene, right? Like, um, I wrote a story in Straight Out of Deadwood, uh, in which it's two humans and three monsters in a basically a ghost town in the Wild West. And so the first scene, though, the two humans haven't met, and I just have my protagonist for several pages. Um, and like, how do you make that interesting? Well, for, fortunately, it's a Western. And so as we all know, the landscape is a character in a Western, mm -hmm. and the first scene is her walking with no dialogue into town and drinking some water and then looking around and all this stuff, except that it's there's movement because she is having a knockdown, drag out, screaming fight with the landscape, right? <laughs> and an argument which has killed her horse before the story came out and uh, the desert killed her horse. And she's still like, she's in a knockdown, drag out fight with the wild west landscape itself. And so there is that isolation but she's but the landscape is a character so you know there's the sort of wrapping of the isolation that was a technique i i was able to because it was an anthology of westerns i was able to do that for that right uh, take advantage well, of that trope yeah. so i think one, one of the things that's interesting is that we talk to ourselves to differing degrees like mm -hmm. some people have a constant internal monologue slash dialogue with themselves with the western landscape <laughs> with the whatever it is and some people have a much quieter space inside their heads um some people in their car, alone in their cars shout at traffic and some don't <laughs> yeah. some some people will narrate what they're doing and sometimes that's you know i guess you'd hear a voice and sometimes it's just to keep track of what you're doing you know, it depends on how your brain works. It's you know, great if you're writing a radio play, right? Well, and you and you learn to do that as a baby, <laughs> right? That mm -hmm. a lot of your initial reality concepts come from interaction with your parent or your caregiver or your sibling when you're small. And so you, you internalize aspects of that. Um, depending on who you are and how your brain works and all that nice stuff. Because you, if, if your parent is 
for example, tying your shoelaces and they're not saying, we're going to put your shoes on now. We're going to tie the shoelaces here. Let me show you how to tie them or let me tie them for you. Then if that's not, if that dialogue isn't happening, then this thing is happening on your foot and hands are doing things and you never learn what's happening. You don't have language to describe what's happening and you don't have names for things. So later on when the parent says, go tie your shoelaces, you don't, you don't have any context. You can't match that to anything. Um, and I just, I just you know, thought of that, that, that that's how you learn. I mean, you can learn to tie your shoelaces without the words, but you, if you don't have the name for it, you can't then, be told to do it as easily, right? Yeah, and and it might be because you haven't associated that it. Yeah. phrase with the activity. Yeah, this is a thing I do. What is the thing? How do I distinguish it from all the other things that I'm doing? It's <laughs> you have names for things, um, you know, and um, and it's not at all that you can't function without the names for things. It's just right. that some people have a concurrent layer of names for things <laughs> that, are, mm -hmm. that is constantly yeah. going on. So like when I'm by myself, my brain is always going off in some direction, which is kind of interesting because I know that some people can have a really hard time just being on their own alone with their thoughts. All right. Some mm -hmm. people have a really hard time with just being alone and thinking, I don't because my brain is always wanting to do a thing or go off and tell a story or <laughs> all that nice stuff. So. Yep. Yeah, l l like, let me tell you a slight story. When I went to New Zealand in 2017, I got off the plane and got into a rental car. Now New Zealand drives on the other side of the road. So I couldn't listen to music or audio books like I normally do because I want to be distracted, but, but I kept up a running monologue verbally just so okay we're staying on the left side of the road. okay here comes the, here comes the traffic circle we're going to go counterclockwise around the circle i kept using that as a way to teach myself how to drive where everything's reversed in order to calm myself down and keep myself focused on task so i wouldn't get into get into a problem mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it took me all the way it took me a week and change before i was comfortable enough to actually start listening to things and have to turn off that voice it's like, okay, I can listen to audiobooks and music now. I understand how to drive on the left side of the road. And then I had to relearn things after a day when I got back here. Well, the kid, it, 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 wrong. It's, it has often been observed that kids who are doing things that are challenging will talk to themselves while they do them. Mm -hmm. And Guess I get it large. <laughs> you know, it helps us to think through stuff. Kate, are yeah. you here in Audible? I think so. Yeah. Yep. Just wanted to check until I've heard some of these dulcet tones. I'm never quite sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's interesting that, that that's the place I walked in because I've been noticing that at work, like I talk myself through stuff and my boss will come by and be like, you know, you're talking to yourself. And I'm like, yeah, I am. And I'm going to continue. <laughs> hey, but it's like, yeah, I, I wonder about up. people I'm like, no, I'm not sure. never never talk to themselves. I don't, I don't understand why that's supposed to be a sign of, of a problem. It's not, it's. Well, you know, talking to yourself is a sign of insanity. I tell myself that constantly. Yeah. But it's not really, it's a sign of an active mind. I, I think it's that she does not have enough stuff going through her head on a regular basis that she can just sort of keep track of it all. This is not a compliment. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> well, let's hope she doesn't watch this video. <laughs> oh, pretty sure Kate doesn't care. At the point I'm at, I hope she does. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you know, it's it's the whole concept. Did you talk about what we talked about earlier, Juliet? Well, we did not I we did not get to that actually. We were about to get to that and then I saw you were arriving and I was like, "Yes." <laughs> oh, okay. Just get to it. Uh, oh, the thing. Um, we, as a society, especially in the U.S., we have two conflicting cultural requirements about this. One is that in, in movies like Moon and, you know, you've seen this story of 
if you leave someone alone long enough, they will go crazy. Mm -hmm. But the competing cultural narrative, which is more to the fore, more ascendant, is you should be completely self-sufficient in and of yourself. You should be able to do absolutely everything and know everything and do everything, and you should not need anybody else at all. <laughs> yep. like, that's, yeah. that's a fundamental conflict. Yeah, it is. You know, mm -hmm. not to mention that humans are not built that way. We are social animals, and you put us it, alone by ourselves in a desert island, and, you know, Tom Hanks notwithstanding, we're not <laughs> even Tom Hanks is your friend. Well, we can't all be Tom Hanks, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm growing my Tom Hanks on a desert island beard, though. I... Like, what a world that would be. Just make sure you have a nice skate. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, being surrounded by people is no guarantee, right? The professor on Gilligan's Island could do anything with coconuts except make a boat. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah, so I've been thinking hard enough. Coconuts and uh, bamboo, they could have had a boat. Yeah. Yeah. So we are a very social species. But we continue to be social even when physically distanced. And, you know, this has been a pet peeve of mine where people say, you know, internet relationships aren't viable or they aren't valid. They aren't real because you're not in contact with that person and and the you know the my response to that is so when i moved away from my family do i am i no longer friends with my family am i no longer friends with my sister because we're not in physical proximity every day mm -hmm. do people who rely on on the post yeah, to, right is that no longer a relationship just because you're writing letters Right. Yeah. So we use different kinds of technology and we always have to maintain social connections. Um, and just in a situation where you're physically isolated from other people, whether it's because of a pandemic or because um, you're in a tin can going from one planet to another and mm -hmm. You know, yeah, you're with other people, but you're with the same six other people who aren't your family. Uh -huh. So, how do you, you know, as as a member of a social species, what do you do to 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 shift the balance? Juliet was saying earlier um, about it being a, a change in social connections, who you're with all the time, and not forever, not necessarily being isolated from everybody. If you have a family, you're spending more time with your family, not mm -hmm. less. So, so um, here's, uh, uh, another book that you just reminded me of uh, from I think the 60s or 70s by Michael Moorcock called The Black Corridor. It's a standalone and it takes place. Um, this guy, who is not a very happy person, as you can tell, um, is the steward of a spaceship that has got a bunch of people in suspended animation. He's the only one awake on the spaceship. It is fleeing Earth, which has had a civilizational collapse. And uh, the story is periods of time where he's on the spaceship with long flashbacks as to everything that went wrong on Earth before he left. So the character is in isolation, but the book, the number of pages devoted to his isolation versus devoted to a society that is not isolated, but is going through a, you know, a rough transformation is, is very slow, uh, small. So most of the book actually takes place on Earth as flashbacks, and you slowly get to the point where the spaceship launches, right? And then you're at kind of, the, then you're at the end of that thread is the beginning of where the, the present time thread on the... On so the I think there's I also think when you're building another, um, a similar kind of thing in a way is the book Use of Weapons by uh, Ian Banks, which has two timelines. Oh, we lost Kate. Uh, two timelines, but um, it, and in neither timeline is the protagonist alone physically in a room, but you come to realize 
that he is alone in many, in all the ways that count, right? Like he's around other people, but he's an agent for this alien civilization called the culture. He's been taken out of his home world mm -hmm. and uh, he is basically on his own. And he's put on like a third world and a fourth world to do the dirty work of the culture and as an agent for them, but he's not of the culture and he is separate from it. And he's separate from whatever world he's stationed on. And in the flashbacks, he's on his home world, but he is isolated in his own self. I don't know, uh, Paul, you were nodding there. So I think you're bringing up something interesting, but I think that it's, it's, I mean, if we go there, that's a whole raft of things because, because the fact that people can feel isolated even when they are surrounded by other people is it's a good observation but then you start getting all kinds of extra stuff so for example you start getting all kinds of of outsider narratives and cultural clash narratives and all this kind of stuff that cause people to feel like they're not part of one thing not part of the other thing i mean and that's a really super valid thing, but I think we could spend a, like way more than an hour just on that. Well, why don't we make that a future topic, like isolation Let's crowd? Do right because I because you could go into things like diaspora communities within other communities. Yeah, I think that's another that's another podcast, as yeah. some people say. So, yeah. I guess when when you suggested the topic or who would. We're talking about the topic um my question was how do we use how can we use the technology to adapt to an unintentional um situation of, of isolation mm -hmm. you know, because there's all kinds of of there's deliberate isolation uh physical isolation there's there's unintentional mm -hmm. physical isolation um social isolation uh so if you were to build a world, I mean, nobody wants to write this story as fiction because it's not. Mm -hmm. But if you were writing the story, if you were building a world, um, where you had to go on with this, what technology would you, would you use? How would you adapt what we have and what would you, change to make it easier to continue being a social species and and how would your social i mean i think we're we're but we're seeing some of that right now aren't we yeah yeah like okay now you're not supposed to see anybody else <laughs> so <laughs> figure out how to you know figure out how to keep your interactions going i had a thought and i i'm, I'm gonna have to try to get it back i was thinking like I was thinking back to the days of the telegraph where telegraph operators would in between passing messages to everybody else talk to each other just because they were in a they were in a job that few other people understand and the people on the other end of the line they're sending these messages to understand what they're going through because they have the same job and you, there were love affairs and romances and all sorts of social interactions taking place over over electronic wires it was like the quote unquote, internet of its time I think we have always try to find ways to interact with people if we physically can't be with people. That's just what humans do because as was said before, we are a social species. So we're going to always reach out for that. You know what? I'm also gonna bring up the question of, of the illusion of being isolated. Um, when I think about uh, a classic example being Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was, all alone <laughs> being tended on a daily basis uh, by somebody please. who never gets mentioned <laughs> yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know like a lot of us this is this this goes back to what kate was saying and i'm sorry that kate's computer keeps freezing but um it goes back to what kate was saying about how we have this narrative about self-reliance right um mm -hmm. And here we are, you know, in our homes, but we're still, we still have all of these technologies that were built up over time in the infrastructure of connection, right? That allows us to have this Zoom meeting, that allows us to, you know, go out and walk on a road, <laughs> you know? Um, 
it's, it's, yeah. So I think it, you know, this kind of isolation is not the same kind as, um, I, you know, I've been asked to, uh, to go and survey a, a planet which has no sentient species that I can actually recognize. Um, because when I think back and I think about people going out into the wilderness, very often they weren't really isolated either because they were in somebody else's house, right? That they just didn't want to acknowledge that that was somebody else's house. And so yeah. it was like, oh, I don't know what to do in this forest, <laughs> whatever. And then the people who lived in the forest were like, well, you know, we could totally tell you all about it if you weren't being, you know, aggressive or whatever, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I think we have to be careful about when we talk about being isolated, what we but talk the, about, what are we isolated from, right? And people who go out as individuals who want to go on solo trips of that nature where they are deliberately removing themselves from the, the social connections and the physical, physical <clears throat> surroundings of members of their own species, these people are not isolated they are choosing it to they, they're not it, it's not the same as somebody being cut off they are choosing to isolate themselves further but they were probably already isolated from the people they were um you know, from the, the other members of their species uh their their first while social groups because I, you know, otherwise, why would you choose to do that? What would make you choose to leave the planet or leave the country or leave the continent and go into a space where you have no hope of connecting with the members of your, your species or your social group? And Kate has no voice. Arg. Kate, there's one more of you. I could admit the other one of you. <laughs> The other one of you has a voice. Hopefully. Yeah. The technology is, is not cooperating with Kate. Okay, now I have two of me. Yeah, but one of you actually makes sounds. So You're in the stereo. <laughs> Let me see if I can stop the other one. Just keep going. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, so where's the solution to all isolation is to duplicate yourself. <laughs> yes, oh, yes, and that go. always goes very, very well. <laughs> you're never alone when you're with clowns. Um, so, uh, what to, to speaking of what Julia said, the most isolated person in history, although deliberately isolated, uh, so maybe doesn't count, um, has been argued was Michael Collins, <laughs> the third Apollo 11 astronaut, mm. who having dropped. Buzz Aldrin and uh, Neil Armstrong on the near side of the moon, continued in orbit to the far side of the moon and was out of sight and radio contact with the earth uh -huh. for uh, a while in his orbit and mm -hmm. the farthest person from the planet in history at that point. And then there were you know, several other guys who did the same thing um, for the other five successful Apollo landings. Um, but but that is, you know, I mean, here he is. He can't even see the, the Earth, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Or his 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 crewmates, or anything, or talk to anyone. Or, you know, um, if he had been abducted by a flying saucer, no one would have known what happened to him, right? Um, yeah. Been, well, they would have known something happened when he didn't. Just by his absence, yes. Um, and Neil Armstrong and, and Buzz Aldrin would have been in deep uh, but that, but... that that, that <laughs> yeah that, that's true um i'm just gonna add the perspective that um he was definitely never uh separated from the infrastructure of connection yeah yeah it was it was temporary he was well, always going to come back around the moon. Of the sure but yeah. he didn't he, he wasn't you know he was in very much space by yeah. himself without a without a trajectory that was going to cause him to come back or whatever i mean 
it's like the, you know you're driving down the road you're gonna hit a dead cell spot yeah <laughs> and if, you know the point of the trip is not to hit that dead cell spot the point of the trip is to get from where you're going to where you know where you were to where you're going but there's that dead cell spot well have we talked about why hermits hermit no we haven't let's even talk talked about hermits. Hermits. so let's I talk know, about like where did we go to 50s pop music but okay <laughs> No, I was, I was thinking about, you know, for some reason I got this, this vision of, of the, all the sort of the island with the Porgs and Luke Skywalker and the whole deal, which, you know, obviously he wasn't isolated, even though he kind of was isolated because he clearly had people tending him. It was a little bit of like the Luke is the uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson of the Star Wars universe. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> I think I tickled Paul. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, fluffy kitty. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. what a My brain has been hijacked. Yeah. Fluffy kitty. We, uh, we should get to pets too, but, but I really want to talk about hermits for a minute. <laughs> okay. Yes. Hermits and anchorites. Oh, yeah. Well, so, so some people get isolated. Like, so you have lepers, right? who were forced out of communities and maybe would live with one another, but would live isolated because people didn't want to have contact with them for the same kinds of reasons, different disease, but same kinds of reasons that we're dealing with now. Um, but some people wanted to just go into isolation to think about things or have religious experiences or, I mean, there, that's clearly a valid course of action across multiple different cultures across history. Yeah. Well, Seeking to simplify to social people, relations. People, I totally get it. Yes, I Don't think you want you everybody it. else to shut the hell up for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but yeah, no, there, there, there were reasons that they would do that so that they could sit and contemplate and that, and I, you know, I don't know that we have enough of that in the current life that we have. We spend so much time doom scrolling and FOMOing and all of that stuff. It's mm -hmm. like, well, how about we just take a step back? But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're completely out of the realm. Like a lot of hermits were hermits because it was a job. <laughs> Because rich people wanted rich to have people a hermit. Had their own hermits, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Sit, 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 on the top, sit, sit on top of the pillar and have people bring stuff to you. Yes. They were not self sufficient hermits. No. No, I, almost none of them were. In fact, yeah, I'm starting. I, I really think that hermits are have typically not been self sufficient. No. Well, that's the funny thing about sorry, humans. Sorry and any species that that needs something more than catch it kill it eat it mm -hmm. if you need to if you need to cook it, it in <laughs> any way you need more than that if you need shelter or clothing or medical care there's you can't and it's just if you look at the simple biology for the first yeah. several years of life a human being is gonna is not gonna survive yeah on their own um, um and and yet we still get narratives where that's i mean we we're talking before about isol about like isolating yourselves and the self-sufficiency i'm thinking of um i'm sure cliff's read alexi panchin's rite of passage and where, where, as it where in, in the in the spaceship society, you, you get dropped down on a planet and you have to survive a month on your own. Yeah, that's your space bar mitzvah right there. Yeah. 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 Very. Well, uh, I mean, what what stupid movie was that with Will Smith? Uh, After Earth. <laughs> you know, the one hundred is roughly the same thing. I mean, there's a lot of these. Mm hmm. Um, where it's, you know, I, and I think what would be the first one? What's the one with the kids all stranded on the island and they're horrible and piggy and all that? Oh, you mean Lord of the Flies? I do mean that. 
<laughs> I like the fact that the real story came out and it isn't anything like that at all. I heard that, yes. It's like they, they didn't dissolve into barbarism after all. No, they, were, they didn't. They were more civilized than the adults. Amazing. Well, sometimes that's not too tough. <laughs> no, that's okay, low bar, admittedly. <laughs> um, I should say that out loud. But, and, and, you know, I think it, it behooves us to make, to, to think intentionally about how we choose which people we tend to go through life with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that we've been choosing astronaut crews wrong. Yeah. Um, I think it would be easier to send people who are connected to each other and teach them what they need to know than send people who know lots of stuff and then teach them to try to get along. This is the basis for Lost in Space. Also, Mission to Mars, they were sending married couples in that movie for that same reason, because they know each other, so you can just train the married couple. Yeah, except for the divorce rate is 50%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just, you know, yeah. throw it out there. Get, get married couples made up of divorcees. <laughs> well, I'm like, why not a polycule? That works. I know. <laughs> Except drama, 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 but you know. Yeah, but they're all along with their drama in space. Is not that not the best solution ever? <laughs> well, and if you're writing a drama, then I guess drama is good, right? <laughs> yeah. You know. I, yeah, I need never get drama with anybody else. <laughs> As the salute turns, you know, stay tuned. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, I think that one of the things that we can do as science fiction writers is to play with a bunch of these ideas and and maybe see where they go. Because it might be really fun. I actually think writing a polycule, you know, on a Mars mission is hysterically funny. Um, and I would read the hell out of that if you wrote it, Kate. Would you? Yes, I would, too. Hell yeah! Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think about it, like, the people in my sphere, like, you guys, mm -hmm. um, all of you have other skills. You know, I'm fairly certain that if they sent the five of us to Mars, we could probably figure out how to put together the prefab housing. Just saying. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and it would be a lot more fun than watching actual astronauts do it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and and if if we discovered that the instructions had nothing to do with the reality of putting it together, it, we'd probably be talking to this stuff a lot, but we would figure it out and we would solve it. Yes, and then we would have very stern letters to write to the technical writers. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's that funny because I just it. had this thought um, where uh, we recently rewatched um, Sense8. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you made me think of it, uh, uh, Kate, because of your, your idea of people who are connected who have a bunch of different skills. <laughs> um, and, and boy, those eight people in these far flung regions were very good at solving problems. <laughs> they, but, that's, but that's what humans are. Humans are a bunch of people with very different skills. And, and because you need to, if, if you, it takes time. And, and dedication to learn enough of one skill of, of say, weaving mm -hmm. to to produce something that is really useful for people who have other skills, things that, you know, so you're not able to grow food for yourself. So you're relying on somebody else with those skills. And, and that's what a human society is. You take the different skills and you put them together and you use them to support each other so that you all survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we it's, are well, it's demonstrating kind of, right now, not us, but a lot of other people are demonstrating they really don't get that. Well, anybody who uses the word socialism pejoratively yeah. does not understand that. <laughs> but it's also that the skills that you say you need on the job description are not actually the skills you need. Hello, Apollo 13. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, they had to improvise, and that was what was the part that was really important was the improvisation. Yeah, mm -hmm. and also the team of engineers at NASA groundside figuring out what they needed to do. Yeah, that's yes, but that's what I mean. But that's who I'm talking about is 
uh, if you've seen the dish, the moment when they throw everything onto the table and go, okay, this is what you have to work with. And the one guy just looks at him like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> and, and they, they did it anyway. Oh. They did it anyway because they were the world's best engineers at the time. <laughs> so they were all working for NASA. So here's a book. Um, it's about 40 years old. Uh, Don Vinci Heaven Chronicles, which is a, a more or less a collection. It's got some short stories and a uh, novella. And the novella is was originally published on its own as The Outcasts of Heaven's Belt. And in that novella, there is uh, a spaceship from one solar system, human society, going to the Heaven Belt system. Um, and the spaceship crew uh, from the other society consists of a group marriage. Uh, so it's, uh, it was pretty cool. Um, it's not quite, um, it was kind of weird because it was still sort of, I mean, it was like the 1970s. So, so there were limitations on, on the group marriage was like all the men were married to each of the women, but not to each other. And the women weren't married to each other. It was just you know, but, yeah. but, but that was a sign of the times, I think. Yeah. And um, so uh, I'm sorry, Kate dropped out just as I was getting to that. Yeah, oh. I mean, Kate keeps having difficulty with her computer. So. But, uh, you know, speaking of isolation and failures, um, you know, polar expeditions like the, or Antarctic expeditions, um, like um, who, go, who goes there, which became the thing, right? You know, uh, big. There's a there's there's Doctor Who is also very well known for isolating a bunch of characters in a lighthouse or in a on a, a moon base or wherever, um, a Martian station. And then, for one thing, it reduced costs because you have a smaller cast but fewer sets. But but also, um, there's you know a plot advantage to isolating a bunch of people and put them in a pressure cooker. Uh, there was a short story that became a Twilight Zone episode called Five Characters in Search of an Exit, where it's just five people in different costumes, um, you know, and there's a twist ending, but basically what they are, they're in a, they're in a big round featureless room, uh, and they're trying to figure out who they are, where they are, how they got there, you know, um, they, have, they have amnesia. Um, there's a book by uh, William Slater called House of Stairs. No. Which no, let's no. all Skinnerist yeah. uh, behaviorism. Yeah, but we don't and like Skinnerism. Apparently hates it. So there you go. <laughs> but it's about isolation. It's a disturbing book. It is. It's about five teenagers so, in complete isolation from everyone else. Yeah, but you know, okay, so so, but we got so we gotta we gotta look at some things though. Um, I think there is a gender divide here. Yeah, in the way that people interpret how people are going to respond to isolation or or how power struggles are going to work out between particular types of people. Um, you know, there are a lot of narratives about force and and, you know, like and there are other narratives about cooperation. They don't have to be gendered, but they often are. Mm -hmm. um, and so like the 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 actual Lord of the Flies people who got stranded on an island. That wasn't a gendered thing. And they cooperated and it was it was great and they survived for like 18 months, right? Um, so that wasn't a gendered thing. But I think a lot of our narratives teach us to think that, that there is this sort of um, dominance ritual sort of inevitability that a power struggle always has to do with force and violence and that kind of stuff. Um, and those gendered, those narratives are gendered, I think, in, in at least in the United States. Um, so. Well, we also have the assumption that men are going to vie for being the top spot and women are going to like organize in a more flat direction. I don't think that's also true. Either. No, indeed not. Yeah but that's what our narrative serves us up. Um, and there's, a, you know, and there's a, there's, you know, one of the things that we haven't talked about that I don't know that we've talked about um, is the gender expectations. Like mm -hmm. what are you expecting is going to happen on that nine month trip to Mars? And are we planning on starting a colony? In which case, how are we going to do that? And so, 
are we going to go back to the 1960s and be like, well, we have a huge tank of sperm and three people and, you know, like, <laughs> and, you know, and, or we, we can do Dune where, you know, women are just tanks to, to, to pump out the next generation. And there's a lot of sci-fi that does that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, pretty much anything before 1965, like women were ornaments and, and basically sex toys. Um, so, except for Judith Merrill. Um, so, you know, it just- <laughs> We're like, actually uh, Jack Williamson in the 1930s, the uh, Legion of Space, there was a woman who controlled the fate of the entire solar system because only she had the knowledge to construct a weapon that would defeat the enemy. No, it was knowledge. What do you know? Yes. <laughs> who knew? Also, this is Jack Williamson's really old. Uh, uh, this was when he was not so old, you know? Um, <laughs> no, but I'm like, I didn't realize, is he still alive? No. No, okay, he, that's, he lived yeah, he passed. 90, <laughs> published until his death. Um, yeah. Amazing. Uh, I could go on after this about meeting Jack Williamson and asking him what it was like to ride in a covered wagon because he did. Okay, we will uh, table that for later because that's a fascinating story. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a whole bunch of assumptions that we haven't really been challenged. I mean, I don't think that anyone... Other than Houston, Houston, do you read? Have I ever seen an all-female group of astronauts doing anything? Mm-hmm. Well, there's that the story did not end healthy, I assume, right? Books, right? Lady astronaut series. Which uh? Calculating well, the well, well, they'll, 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 yeah, they start off as all men, and the women break into. The astronaut car in the lady astronaut series so so then uh, that's that's not that's not the same as houston houston mm, okay yeah that's on my to read list they're good uh, they're very good yeah and since a lot of authors fell off it today or this last week um yeah things are moving up <laughs> things are moving yeah, up. yeah. Thinking, oh, yeah. Get along. the tbr list just got a shooting <laughs> yeah but it's sort of like, you know, we we assumed that everyone was going to be really professional on the ISS. And when you get the Russians and American women, that is not what happens. Um, so I... I okay. And then there's the NASA astronaut drive cross country wearing space diapers story. That, that was just... There is, and there's, you know, we have not had a lot of astronauts who end up in public positions of office. Um, Valentina Tereshkova is still in office. John and Glenn was a senator. Yeah, well, yeah. But he's an exception that proves the rule. Right. Sure. Uh, he was a rarity. Yes, uh, and um, what's his face? Mark, what's his name, is probably going to win his election. So, yeah. But, but yeah, there's, there's a whole lot of, of this that we have not seen in print. And, and I think I think we have to go out and imagine more wider. Yep. Always. <laughs> Always more and wider. That is what we're about here at the <laughs> <laughs> dive into world building. <laughs> mm-hmm. Further, faster, higher. Ostensible <laughs> reason we're even talking about these subjects. Is yeah. Right. Well, but it now, is. I definitely want Kate to go out and write that book about the poly. Play, oh, cool in uh, space. Martin, uh, okay. Mission, because I want to read it, and I don't feel qualified to write it. So, so you go. <laughs> okay. Well, so here we are. It's five o'clock. I am hoping that I can talk to you guys after we come off the streaming for a minute. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna end our live stream. Thank you for everybody who watched, and we will try to do this next week. 